Hi, my name is Afa Minusapir. I'm um, so excited to be presenting at the Undergraduate Research Symposium this year um, with my thesis the research, Countermapping the Coos Bay Estuaries, Amplifying Indigenous and Environmental Histories. I'd like to start with a land acknowledgement, which is to say that the UO exists on, and this research was created on, Kalapuya land, the original and ancestral land of the Kalapuya people of the southern Willamette Valley, who were violently displaced, and it's our duty and responsibility to recognize them, uplift them, and create um, passages for reparations for Indigenous life in this area and across the U.S. Um, I am super grateful for my advisors, Dr. Jason Yonker, who is the current chief of the Coquille Indian tribe, among other responsibilities, Dr. Liska Chan, who's the department head at the um, Landscape Architecture Department, and Dr. Catalina Deonis, who is my CHC advisor and representative. I am also extremely grateful for the Vice President for Research and Innovation Undergraduate Fellowship, as well as funding from the Wayne Morse Center for my materials for this project and the mentored research program through the Clark Honors College. I'm gonna give a brief overview for what I'll be talking about today. I'm gonna to start with an introduction, move to frameworks, which include cultural geography and mapping and counter mapping, talk about methods, give a historic background of Coos Bay, which includes native narratives, ecological and colonial narratives, and a return to a native narrative. Briefly discuss my overdrawings, my product of this research, and um, give a conclusion as well. So I'll start with the introduction. Um, to situate us about where Coos Bay is located, it's in the southern Oregon coast, um, southwest Oregon um, coast. Here's a zoomed in map. Coos Bay is kind of an upside down V. Um, it's a beautiful area, but has a really violent colonial history. And that's the source of my um, topic for this thesis research. So my project examines the invisible histories of Coos Bay through creative forms of mapping. Um, the, um, I chose to study estuaries because the importance of estuaries cannot be overstated. Um, estuaries are the stretches and branches of waterways where sea water meets fresh water. They um, blend nutrients from the sea and fresh water. They provide habitat to diverse species and they also filter water. So that's why I've chosen this um, environmental feature to study. I'm using an overdrawing method, which is, was developed by Dr. Chan, and I'll speak to that more later. And then I'm incorporating subjectivity and personal background into this project. I am non-native, and so I have limited capacity for understanding the indigenous and environmental landscape in this area. But I have a, a family history of um, displacement and exile. My family is Persian and was exiled from Iran. And my family has instilled in me that sensitivity to issues of exclusion and violence, and I bring that light to this project. Um, so to move to my frameworks, I want to talk about cultural geography and mapping first. Cultural geography is a very broad term which recognizes that the culture and arts fun, um, fundamentally shape and are in conversation with geography and vice versa. Cultural mapping narrows cultural geography to um, art through mapping or mapping uh, as an artistic practice. And I further narrow my work through counter mapping, which is a um, specific lens that recognizes um, the power maps hold. It's a decolonial form of mapping and it recognizes that maps um, serve goals and functions of the state. Um, so these are an example of counter mapping and also you know, cultural mapping. Um, these are passages of um, a border crossing and kind of experiences of danger and safety. Um, so I can talk about my methods next. My site visits and materials were really exciting. I actually, um, I found a dearth of access at first to historic cartographic information. And then I was able to access some through the UO libraries and through my advisors. And then I visited Coos Bay a total of five times in the summer and um, last winter. And I found that the estuaries I was wanting to study were on private land and I couldn't access them. So I actually hopped into a kayak and I kayaked all of the areas with this 
helpful dog. Um, and I got to stay in South Slough, which is a branch of estuaries um, south of Coos Bay. So this is the work I was doing um, while I was there. My creative work is called Overdrawings. I mentioned that it is a, a process um, an art practice developed by Dr. Chan that uses the method bricolage, which means grabbing what is at hand. That means that you sift through, you take as many materials as possible from your site, from walking in it, taking photos in it, looking at maps of the site, looking at the history. It's a really subjective process and pulling it together and sifting through it and pulling out ideas, themes, collaging them, and then enmeshing your ideas in maps in order to form this final kind of composition of ideas and maps and so forth. So um, I'll show you more what that process looks like in a bit. I'm next gonna talk about the historic background of Coos Bay. Um, and um, I'm gonna start with a native narrative. Nati um, I'd like to first recognize that Coos Bay is the ancestral site of three linguistic and cultural groups, the Hanas, Millic, and Athabascan speakers. Much of what is known um, about this area comes from salvage ethnographies, which were um, records of data about these tribes that were uh, attempted to record the um, last remnants of quote unquote dying out cultures. And they have really problematic roots. They were often quick and coercive and they reflect colonial values. So much, most of what is known come from an amalgamation of these salvage ethnographies, which we have to look at really closely to identify their purpose. And then um, ancestral knowledge that has been retained from um, the colonial period forward and, po and pre-colonial period forward. So I'm not gonna speak to actually what the wealth of cultural data that is out there, but I am going to say very quickly that the area is marked by household clusters. There isn't overhead governmental authority in this region. There are lots of intertribal connections. Familial practices look like um, families being matrilineal but patrilocal, and there's an immense um, uh, record and ongoing practice of stewardship of the land, which involves respect and mutual processes of uh, gratitude and reciprocity with the land. I'm going to talk mostly about the colonial and post-colonial period. In the 17 and 1800s, there was a rapid colonial expansion into this area um, because of the extensive social and cultural and trading ties that already were established um, before colonial settlers. This allowed for immense trade and marriage within um, and between colonial and indigenous people, and um, those same ties allowed for the spread of disease to happen super quickly before colonial settlers even arrived. So we see that 90% of people in this area passed away before colonial settlers arrived. Um, and then there's a rapid expansion into this area. In 1850, the first ship enters. 1852, there's the first white colonial village. In 1853, there's the first gold rush, which brings people overnight. And amid increasing instances of violence, largely due to encroachment and coercion, um, indigenous tribes, all indigenous tribes in this area were forced to sign the Palmer Treaty in 1855, which attempted to quote unquote, remove them, the native people from harm's way. They were promised a reservation and they ceded over a hundred or hundreds of thousands of acres of land in compensation for a reservation or no, in, um, in exchange for compensation and a reservation, they were forcibly marched overland to the Siletz Reservation over 60 miles, and that's known as the Oregon Trail of Tears. And when they arrived at their reservation, they found that the treaties were not ratified. And there were horrible reservation conditions. They were displaced without treaty ratification. It was unjust and, and quite horrifying. There was lack of access to food and water. Um, they were discouraged from speaking traditional languages or practicing traditional cultures. And it's estimated that 50% of people who made it to the reservation passed away there. Um, the, I wanna return to survival and resiliency um, because it's really important that we recognize that uh, knowledge and people were, or people did pass down knowledge, in fact, um, women who cohabitated with white men were allowed to stay in the area. There were about, 
um, some of the only people allowed to stay and culture, language, um, uh, land use practices and so forth were passed down through these women among other people. And it's important that we note that there are still people existing in this area that are indigenous. I'm going to talk about ecological and colonial narratives next, and I'm going to go a little bit quickly for sake of time. I'm going to start with cartography, which is to say that um, the first step to uh, toward white domination in this area was to map it, important specifically because it allowed people to parcel up and sell this area. These are the first maps coming out of Coos Bay in the 1860s. Um, and then there's all of other forms of ecological and colonial damage um, to this environment, including the jetty um, being built and kind of um, hurting the formation of um, the water leaving the estuaries, dredging and land development, timber, which um, eroded forest land and soil and pulled a lot of um, silt into the environment, along with taking out a lot of cultural sites. Um, and then dam dams diking and agri agricultural dams were used to um, facilitate the transportation and diking as well, to facilitate the transportation of these logs. And we can see that in this map, um, Coos Bay is the hardest hit area of Oregon for dams. It's just, um, yeah, so um, really massive history here of ecological and colonial damage. And I'm gonna return to a native narrative briefly, which is, um, to point out that over and over, there is a legalized erasure of Native people. In 1888, there were boarding schools to separate children from their families. 1924, the Indian Citizenship Act, which prevented Indian um, Indian and tribes from self-governing. 1934, the Indian Reorganization Act, which splintered tribes. 1952, Indian Relocation Act, which gave um, Native people one-way tickets to major cities to separate them from their homes and culture and family. And then in 1954, the Indian Termination Act, which terminated over 62 tribes in Oregon, including the tribes in this area. In 1984 and 1989, the Siti and Kokol tribes were restored after immense, challenging, uphill, um, hard, hard work. And, um, and, and it's really powerful that they were able to do this, but we can see that it's not that long ago, actually, within the last 30 years about. I'm talking about my overdrawings next, giving um, an overview of the process and the examples and reflections I have from that process. The process looks like that image from earlier. It looks like sifting through all of these images, photos, ideas, and kind of pulling through themes. So I'm gonna go through these kind of quickly. These are tracings I made over maps to pull out what kinds of landscapes were changed, how were the estuaries impacted and so forth. And then these were the five overdrawings that I ended up with. For the sake of time here, I'm not gonna be um, going over them in depth, but I am gonna give one example, which is called, um, this overdrawing I made called South Slough Runs. Um, I think that the antithesis to the colonial method of extraction in this area is native use of resources and stewardship of land. It's exemplified by a powerful story of the first salmon run in Coquel history. Um, so two tribes make up this, um, the, the her present day tribes make up this region. One is the Siti Klusi, the confederated tribes of the Kuz, Lower Amkwa, and Sayusla, and the other is the Kokwal Indian tribe. And so they have this powerful story about gratitude and recognizing um, the reciprocity between tribes and with the land. And I, I took that story and I wrote a poem about it and I fit it into the, um, the tide coming um, at low tide in front of the area that I was staying. So this is a image straight on from the area that I was staying in. This is a blind contour drawing, meaning I drew it without looking at the lands or without looking at the paper, only looking at the landscape. And then I filled it in with this um, really beautiful story that demonstrates tribes shared networks and agreements, practices of gratitude and land stewardship. Um, this overdrawing accomplishes several things that, that um, are are kind of my biggest conclusions. Overdrawings attempt to integrate and interpret the subtext of a place. They encourage ghosts of the place to emerge, and they reflect an experience of the world as a network that connects points and intersects with itself, really questioning what a map can and should look like and what power it yields. 
So in conclusion, um, overdrawings problematize indigenous and environmental invisibility. It's in, I found that it's impossible to draw a landscape in its wholeness. There um, is uh, there is no way to fully convey um, the landscape in one picture. Each map intends to show a different facet of meaning. I hope to explicitly acknowledge personal and subjective understandings of place in this project. And also, um, in, in the most key thing I took away was knowledge as um, a making and being in the landscape. I saw firsthand that I made the most connections when I was making and being in the landscape, and I learned that this is actually similar to how C.T. Clusi and Coquille tribes situate their knowledge, which is, um, I learned that many um, tribes, tribal people don't express that they don't know cultural practices and values when they're removed from the landscape, but in the landscape, they can speak to a breadth of cultural knowledge. And I'll finish by saying that place-based embodied emotional um, languages and uh, meanings aren't widely, aren't widely accepted in academia, but they are critical forms of meaning making. Thank you so much.